All right, thank you. Are you all enjoying it? Have some energy left for the last session before the closing keynote? So as you heard, um, I'm both a mathematician and a software architect. And so this talk is going to be a bit of both. And I'm going to tell you something about how I look at software and programming from a more mathematical pr perspective. So what I want to talk to you today about is, should put on my clicker, hard problems in programming. And those of you who know the classic joke, we all know that there are two hard problems in programming, right? We have caching validation, we have naming things, and of course we have off by one errors. But I would argue that there are some more problems, hard problems in programming that we forget here. Like stuff like string escaping, especially if it's nested, if we have to escape strings for use in JavaScript within HTML or something. Stuff like time zones and handling date times. Things like character encoding. These are also all pretty hard problems that I often see people struggling with. And what, I, what my opinion is, is that many of these difficulties are related. It's all kind of the same problem, or it originates from the same source. And that's what I want to talk to you about in this talk. So, um, this talk, um, it is my personal view, right? It's the way I look at things, and it isn't an absolute truth. There is some mathematics in it that is an absolute truth, but the rest of it is just my view, and I hope it makes you think about how you look at this. Uh, your opinion may differ, I'd like to hear about that, and I hope it opens your eyes for a couple of things. So, first let's talk about data, right? All our programs handle data. Let's look at some examples of data. Um, I have a number here, right? Which number is this? It might, it might be 11, right? If it's written in decimal. It might be 3, if it's written in binary. It might be 9, if it's written in octal. 17, in hexadecimal. We don't know. We need to know how we interpret this number to know what its value is. Um, suppose we have a byte somewhere in memory caused by our program. What does this byte signify? If it's a number, an integer uh, of one byte, kind of byte type, it may be the number 66. But if it's a character encoded as ASCII, it might be the letter B, or it might also be part of a UTF-8 sequence or a floating point number. We don't know what this byte means unless we know how it will be interpreted by the program. Let's look at some JSON data. We have some data about a person and his income. So what do we know from this? Well, not much. Uh, we don't know if this, this is a monthly income or a yearly income. It might be an income in US dollars. It might also mean uh, it might also be an income in Zimbabwean dollars, in which case this wouldn't be much. Right. So again, the interpretation of the data means a lot. We could have a word, right? If someone gave this to you, and you're an English speaker, you would be happy because well, you got a present from them. I don't know if there are any people in the room who speak German. In German, this means poison. It's kind of different. Again, it matters how we interpret the data. We could also have a prime number. Or actually, this isn't really a prime number because I have replaced one of the digits with an X. And that has a reason, because if I would write out this complete prime number here, that would be illegal in certain jurisdictions. I don't think the Czech Republic would be that troublesome, but in the USA, I could get into trouble with putting the full number here. And that's because this prime number, it, enco it encodes something else. If we root, write this prime number out in binary, save that to a file, it would be an executable implementing the DCSS algorithm, which has nothing to do with cascading style sheets, but is software for cracking the encoding on DVDs. 
And this algorithm was banned in the United States. So people were trying to find creative ways to, well, work around that and hide the number in different other stuff. So they came up with this prime number. And since there are all kinds of catalogs of the largest prime numbers on the internet, well, they kind of had to publish it. So the algorithm can, or at least the program can still be found on the internet. But what I want to take, uh, what I want you to take away from this is that all data has different meaning under different interpretations. And that's what we are going to look into right now. Um, we need some theory. Let's look at functions. Functions both from a programming perspective and from a mathematical perspective. And we are going to limit ourselves to functions of one variable right now, but this is easily extended to mul uh, functions of multiple variables. But let's keep it easy for now. So most of us in high school, we were taught to think of a function like this. Our function is kind of a black box. We usually call it f. And we have a value that we put in it that we usually call x. And when we put it in the box, then another value comes out of the box. And that's our y. And we, and we write y is f of x. But mathematicians look at this in a slightly different way because they are pretty much interested in what can we put into this box? We can't just put anything into this box. If we have a function that would square numbers, we couldn't put a cat in it. So mathematicians, they distinguish two other concepts, which are the domain and the range of the function. And we say that f goes from its domain, which we call d here, to its range, which we call r. And it means that the x has to be in the domain, and then the output is always a member of the range, r. And these are sets which we can kind of compare to classes when programming or types. And this may look technical or a bit overly uh, strict, but actually we do kind of the same when we program, right? If we write a function in PHP, we could, as of PHP 7.1 and uh, 7.0, we could put a type here for the input, which is kind of the domain. And we can set a return type, which is, is kind of the range. So when programming, we also do this stuff. Let's look at a more concrete example. We have a function that rounds numbers to an integer. So its input, its domain, it is a float, and its output is an integer. And essentially, this function, for every member of the domain, it maps it to a member of the range. So a function is also kind of a mapping between those two. And this mapping, it does not have to be one-to-one. -one. Um, we can just have as well have a function uh, that has two different inputs, let's call them x1 and x2, that with that function map to the same output value y. This is perfectly legal, and we call such a function, we call it not injective, and a function that doesn't have such a situation, for which every input maps to a different output, it's called injective. As an example again, for our rounding function, um, both the inputs 4.35 and the input 3.35, 84, they map to the same integer, namely 4. So if this is possible, can we also do the reverse? Is it possible for one input value to map to two different output values? I see someone shaking his head on the first row. Yes, mathem mathematically seen, this is impossible, at least not in a pure function. And also strict programming languages like Haskell, which has pure functions, this is not possible. Because, well, we would put different, uh, want the same thing in and we would get different things out. But in programming, it is possible in an impure function. Such a function would depend on something like randomness, some other global or local state, it would do I.O., right? If we have a function like file get contents, which gets the contents of a file, we could put the same file name in twice, but if the contents of the file have changed in the same time, we would get different outputs. And also those functions may be dependent on the system clock or something. 
there's another problem. Um, it might happen that there's a value in our domain that we cannot really map to a value uh, in the range. So what do we do with this? Well, mathematicians, they have an easy solution. They say, well, that value is not part of the domain. We just cut a hole in the domain, and we call this our domain set, and, well, the x is not part of it, so we cannot put it into the function. But since the mapping of, well, uh, mathematical sets to types or classes in programming is not very easy, right? We don't have a type that says any number except zero. Um, we cannot do that when programming. So instead, we, well, we keep the original domain, and if we put such an x in our function, it would just throw an exception, and we're also fine. All right. So now that we've seen this, let's look at representation and interpretation, which is what we actually want to talk about. And these have, in my opinion, to do with the level of abstraction around functions. So at the right, I have an arrow which represents the level of abstraction, right? We can have things that are, have, are at a very low level ab of abstraction, things like bytes or electric currents, and we cannot attach very much meaning to them. Or we have stuff that's at a very high level of abstraction, like types we create in our own code, our own classes, or things like a value object that represents money or something. So a round function, it maps from a float to an integer. And these are kind of at the same level of abstraction. There are both numbers, and we can do calculations with them or something. It's not too, high, too low level. We don't need to worry about how they are stored in memory. But there are also functions that change the level of abstraction. For example, we could look at a function that serializes a value type, or money, to a string. So our money value type, it's pretty rich. We can do currency conversions with it and other calculations. Whereas the string it converts to is pretty dumb. We don't really know it's money anymore or something. We can't do calculations with it, so we lowered the level of abstraction. In the same way, we can view a function that encodes a string as UTF-16. It goes from a string to an array of bytes, in essence. And it also lowers the level of abstraction. With a string, we can do things like uh, substrings and concatenation and stuff like that. And they don't work that well anymore on a byte sequence. And this is what I think of as a representation. We translate a higher level concept to a lower level of ab abstraction. And essentially, this is just the same data, but we just put it into a different form, a different representation. And characteristic for a representation is that usually all input values are supported from the domain. We have a domain without holes. Any mo money object that we create in our system, we can represent as a string. And any string we have, we can represent in UTF-16. We can also have functions that raise the level of abstraction back up, right? When decoding a byte sequence from UTF-16, we get something that we can work with more easily. Or we can parse a string representation of a money type back to a money value object, which we can do calculations with and stuff like that. And these raise the level of abstraction back up. This is what I would like to call an interpretation. We translate a low-level concept. Often it's kind of translating it back to a higher-level concept. And correct characteristic for an interpretation is that usually not the entire domain is supported. So we have kind of the situation with holes in it, and we have to draw exceptions for some input values. Not every byte sequence is valid UTF-16. Not every string represents some type of money. So why do we do this? Um, ideally, we would always want to work at a higher level of abstraction, right? We also write PHP code, not assembly, just because PHP has a higher level of abstraction and it's easier to work with. Well, just remember that eventually your data is going to end up on something like this, if we store it. This is just magnetic grains on a platter, right? So this is a very low level of abstraction. We can just put a money value type on this. We have to dump it down to a lower level of abstraction to be able to store it. And if we send data over a network, this is what it looks like. 
Again, we can't just put a string through this. We have to dump it down to bytes, which are then converted into bits and electric current and TCP package and stuff like that. So, how it usually looks like is when transmitting or storing data, we kind of go from a high level of abstraction and we dump it down all the way for transmission into some physical process, magnetic grains, electric currents, optical signals, stuff like that. And we send it or we store it. And then at the other side, we reinterpret it back up to a higher level of abstraction that we want to work with. I want to talk with you about escaping. And what this has to do with this. Um, we escape all the time. Maybe not this more in the time of ORMs, but we do escaping for SQL, HTML, LDAP maybe. And we have all learned that we should do that, I hope at least. So if we have a PHP script like this, which takes a username from the post data and executes a query with it, uh, looking for the user with the given username, we have all learned that we should escape the username for putting it into the string. Why have we learned that? Well, often people say, yeah, that's for security. Because, well, what if someone put in a username like this, right? If we would not escape the string, we have just deleted our user table. But is this really a thing we do for security or as a protection against malicious users? What if someone's username was John O'Shea? With notice the accent, single quote in it. If we would put that into our SQL query unescaped, it will also break the query. This has nothing to do with security or hacking attempts or something. And it doesn't even matter that this comes from user input, right? Um, if it wasn't post data, but we would just retrieve some username by any API, it doesn't matter where the data comes from. Still, if we put it into the query, we need to escape it. So it's nothing to do with user input. So any source of this data, it isn't uh, for security, it isn't for user input, it's just properly representing the username as we have it for use in an SQL statement. So I may have an unpopular opinion here, but in my view, string escaping is not a security measure. It's just properly representing your data for how you are going to use it. So in the view of the functions we saw earlier, we can kind of view it like this, right? We have a function db escape string that translates from something that is a string to, yeah, I called it an SQL fragment. We'll get to that. It's kind of an awkward name. And it maps the string O'Shea to O'Shea with the quote escaped. And why it's maybe difficult to see this as a representation is because of how this function works, right? We pass in it a uh, string John O'Shea and it returns the same string with the quote escaped. But what if instead of this function, we had another function that's called something like S SQL string literal or something, which also enclosed it into the quotes. Notice the two extra quotes at the beginning and at the end. Right now we have something that's actually a thing in SQL. It's the string representation of SQL. And because all the string escaping functions do the first instead of the second, it's kind of hard to see what we're doing here. But what we're doing here is we're trying to represent something as something that has meaning in SQL. So it would kind of look like this, or as SQL string literal. You would transform a string to an SQL string literal, with each, which is the representation of the string in SQL. And if we think about it this way, it's not that hard to do nested escaping well, right? If we would have a name that we want to represent as a JavaScript variable, which we put into a JavaScript in HTML and then store that into an, HD, uh, into an SQL database, well, we could, look, could do it like this. First, we represent the string as JavaScript. We construct the JavaScript, we represent the JavaScript as HTML, and then we represent the HTML as an SQ, uh, SQL string and use that to insert it into the database. Now, this 
isn't very common anymore, but I used to see people do things like this. At the beginning of a script, maybe in an include file or something, you go to the entire request super global, and every value in there, you're just going to do HTML entities on it and a SQL escaping function, because that would make the data safe. Right. But if we look at it from a representation perspective, what this means is that we're going to assume that all input data is first going to be used in an SQL statement and then written to HTML. That's insane. That's not what we want. We don't even know at the beginning of the script how this data is going to be used. This is kind of what Magic Quotes did, and it's a bad idea, right? We're not representing it for our concrete use case. We're representing it too early before we know what we're going to do with this data. Another pattern like this is something like you can see here on the screen. Right? You can also walk through all your user inputs and try to detect stuff like SQL injection and then just die the script. I've also seen people do this. But what if I wanted to write a blog post about SQL injection and used, well, an example of a drop table query in there, right? I couldn't. I couldn't save it in a system that uses this. This assumes that every user input is going to put literally in an SQL statement. Just don't do something like this, right? No data is evil or something. It all depends on how we use the data and if we properly represent it for the use case we're going to face. So that's one example of things that go wrong here. Let's look at some others. Um, there's misrepresentation. Um, a function that serializes a money value object could look like this. We have kind of the abstract concept of 10 euros, and we want to turn that into a string, and we could make the string 10 euros out of it. Well, that's fine. Um, another, uh, another implementation of a serialization function could look like this. Instead of euro 10, we just only output 10. But what we get now is if we had another money value object um, that represents $10, and we would serialize that to a string, we would get the same string, right? You can already see here this function is not injective, and that's kind of the problem. Because if we had that string 10 and we wanted to reinterpret it as a money value object, we wouldn't know what value it represents, right? Does it need to map back to the 10 euros, to the 10 dollars, to the 10 Zimbabwean dollars? We don't know. And this is a very contrived example. This is pretty simple, and no one of you is probably going to do this wrong. So, well, things like this don't happen to me, right? Well, how many of you have ever done something like this? We have daytime. Somewhere in the future, maybe it's a daytime for which you set an alarm or a meeting or a test event for a nucle nuclear missile SMS notification system or something, which is in the Europe Prague time zone. And you want to store that in the database and you represent it like this with an offset from GMT. Nothing wrong, right? Except that right now, all the European countries are considering getting rid of daylight saving time. So we don't know what in 2022 will be the time zone offset of Prague. So we're losing information here. We cannot say that it was in Prague anymore. So when the uh, time zones change, we don't know what the new correct time will be. And also things like this. If we have a fraction, one third, and we represent it as a float, we have a lot of digits, but we still can be entirely sure whether the next digit would not be a nine or something, in which case it didn't represent one third. So again, we're losing information here. Or something like if we have a string with all kinds of emoji in it, and we were trying to encode that as ISO 88591, right? which is the Western European encoding. It doesn't support all those Unicode emojis. So I don't even have an idea what would happen. They would probably get lost or replaced by some replacement character. You can't write a string down as this. So remember, 
If your interpretation is lossy, you cannot ever reinterpret it back to the original concept that we had. So if you ensure that your rep representations are injective, they can always be inverted back to the value we had. Now, there's another thing that goes wrong, and that's misinterpretation. Suppose we have a byte sequence, and that represents some sequence of bytes in UTF-8. And if we decode it to a string, it would ri uh, uh, write the string cafe with an accent. And actually, the domain of such a decode from UTF-8 function would not be the entire set of byte sequences. There are only a limited, uh, limited number of byte sequences that represent valid UTF-8. So it actually looks more like this, right? Within the whole set of byte sequences, we have a subset of byte, se byte sequences that represent valid UTF-8. And all the other byte sequences, well, if we try to decode as UTF-8 from that, we would throw an exception. Now the problem is, that of all those byte sequences, there are also byte sequences that represent valid ISO 88591. And the set of those byte sequences overlap with the valid UTF-8 sequences. So instead of trying to decode our byte sequence that we have from UTF-8, we could just as well try decoding it from ISO 88591 in which case we would get something like this. At least it's copyrighted. And you've probably all seen these errors on web pages. It is because the output is written as UTF-8, but reinterpreted as ISO. And the problem essentially comes from this, right? We have two domains which overlap, and without knowledge about how this data was meant to be interpreted, we cannot faithfully say which one it is. But luckily, PHP has a function for that. So in PHP, we have MB detect encoding, which says that it would give us the encoding of a certain string. But once we think about it in this context, right, there are byte sequences that are both valid UTF-8 and ISO. How is such a function even supposed to work? Well, the short answer is that um, MB detect encoding actually tries a sequence of encodings until it finds one that matches. So you have to provide it a search order and it just returns the first one that matches. But that is no guarantee that it's actually the encoding that was intended. So remember, the meaning of data comes from how we interpret it. So that also means that how we interpret it, it could very well be wrong, or at least not how we intended it. What can we do about that? Well, there's a way to try to add hints about how data should be interpreted, and we can send that along with the data. And we do so already in a lot of places. There are things like HTTP headers, which get sent along with the content. Things like content type and content encoding and content language. And they are sent with the body, and they describe how the body should be interpreted. And in UTF-8, you also have a byte order mark, which is prepended to your string, which can say whether the sequence is in big endian or in little endian. And also in real life, there are examples of this, right? If we have sheet music, we put the symbols in front to know which kills they are. Because without them, we wouldn't know what these nodes represent. And what these interpretation hints essentially do is, in the example of a UTF-16 byte sequence uh, with a byte order mark, we have the sequences that represent valid UTF-16 little endian and the byte sequences that represent UTF-16 big endian, and they overlap. But if we put the byte order mark in it, the byte order mark differs between the two. So we pull the two domains apart so they don't overlap anymore. There are no sequences that are both valid UTF-16 big endian with a byte order mark and UTF-16 little endian with a byte order mark. If we cannot do something like this, we can also try to add some hints by naming our variables, by naming variables after what they represent. 
So we can say that something is a message encoded as UTF-8. We can say that something is a username represented as SQL. We can say that something is a title represented as HTML. And it might help us to spot er errors in our programs a bit earlier. Just look at this, right? We output the content type header, which says that our page is an ISO encoding. And then right below that, we output UTF-8. This is clearly wrong. If we uh, adhere to this convention uh, faithfully, well, if we execute an SQL statement and we pass in a variable that doesn't have an SQL suffix, we know that we're going to put something in that's not properly represented for use in SQL. And if we run HTML entities on something that has an HTML suffix, we know that it is already HTML, so we're double encoding it, which is also wrong. So, this all seems simple, but in PHP there's an additional challenge, and that's the string type. We've already seen that there's conceptually a difference between a string and a byte array. A string just represents an abstract thing on which we can do substring operations and string lengths, and we, can, we just have a sequence of characters. And we have the character encodings, which represent it as a sequence of bytes to transmit or to store in memory. Um, well, let's look at, we have this, right? We have a function that encodes a string as UTF-16. We've seen this before. It maps from a string to a byte array, which is kind of a representation because it lowers the level of abstraction. But in PHP, this is not really how it is because PHP string type is actually a byte array. PHP does not know about the encoding used for a string. It just represents it as a sequence of bytes. And if you do a string length on it, if you don't have function overloading from MB string enabled, you would get a number of bytes, not a number of characters. So how the previous picture actually looks in PHP, something like this. We map from a string to a byte array, but both are actually the same, so we map from one member of the set to another member of the same set. And in practice, that means that we don't explicitly use a function to represent something as UTF-16 or something. Um, but instead, we just always stick to the lower level of abstraction and we, we don't explicitly do a function call anymore, but we just use our string or byte array as if it were a real string under some encoding. So it kind of is like we view something through a different glass at the same moment. And the problem with that is we don't do the interpretation once, but we do it every single time we use that st string or byte array. We reinterpret it every time. We, every time we view it through a different glass. So we could just as well use the same st string or byte array as if it were UTF-8. And then it means something else, and we probably have the risk of misinterpretation. So we cannot really uh, get to a higher level of abstraction. What would be useful is if we would have a proper string type in PHP. Right? If we would have a better type system, it makes it more difficult to misinterpret this data. And well, if our programming language does not provide this, we could try to do so ourselves. So a solution to this could be value objects. So we could create something like this, uh, which represents a UTF-8 byte sequence. And well, since they're coming in PHP 4, we've already made use of type properties. And internally, such a byte sequence is still represented using a string, because that's PHP's natural way of representing a byte sequence. But we've made the constructor private to hide this, and we only use static constructors to abstract how this byte sequence is stored internally. And we have a function to, well, create such a byte sequence from a PHP string, representing that byte sequence, and convert it back to a PHP string. And in the same fashion, we could create a value object that uh, represents also a byte sequence, but then for ISO 88591 encoding. 
It looks exactly the same, except it has a different name. So we can confuse the two. And then we could create something that, well, since the name string is already taken, we could just call it real string. And again, we have a private constructor. And internally, well, we still have to store our string, our high level of abstraction string in some way. So internally, we store it as UTF-16, because that's what most languages do. Um, but we're going to hide this from the outside. So again, we have static constructors, for example, to create such a string from a UTF-8 byte sequence, which involves internally converting that byte sequence to UTF-16 and setting that uh, as the field. And in the same way, we can convert from ISO-88591. And we can also convert or represent them back to byte sequences. We can write a function that creates UTF-8 byte sequences from our real string class. And in the same fashion, we can also encode them as ISO-88589. And once we have these conversion functions in place, well, we can also add all the string operations that we would like to do on a real string without exposing uh, things like character sets and stuff like that. We can just focus on the higher level of abstraction string operations, like concatenating two strings, right? We could write a concat function like this that returns new real string consisting of the two real string instances combined, or uh, take a substring of our string class. And if we would try to use it, well, we first uh, suppose we're reading some data from two files, uh, of which one is UTF-8 encoded, we know that, and we know of the other file that we should interpret it as uh, ISO-88591 bytes. And we have some construction logic to do at the top part, right? Here we read the, uh, the byte sequence from the first file and then interpret it as uh, it as a real string, and we do kind of the same for the other file, except with a different encoding. But after that, we have two real string objects that are at a high level of abstraction, which we can work with without worrying about the original character sets they had. We can do all our string magic that we want without doing anything with encoding. And only at the end, when we well, want to represent them back or write them uh, to storage or send them over the network or something, we just convert them back to our desired encoding, which is at the bottom. So essentially, we had this picture, right, with the uh, UTF-8 sequences and the ISO-88591 sequences, which overlap. And again, we're just pulling these apart by making them separate value objects, also pulling the string type out of it, which was also essentially a byte array. So we get more or less something like this, in which there cannot be any confusion anymore, because all these classes are separated, so we can't misinterpret one for the other. And um, things like this you can also use to convert other, uh, to solve other misinterpretation situations, like if you create a value object for uh, something that is SQL, and you write functions to concatenate pieces of SQL, you can't use them with a normal string, right? So you would have to properly represent stuff for SQL to use these, so you can't forget to escape stuff. Is this worthwhile to add to your code always and all the time? No, I don't think so. Um, it's too much overhead to write all this, to run all this, but for pieces of code where character encoding and things like that is critical and difficult and where the risk of misinterpretation is high, it might be worthwhile to add something like this or to prototype with it to find out how to do it and then just throw it away. So what we've seen is we looked at data and how the meaning of data is influenced by how we interpret it. And we saw that we can see functions sometimes as interpretations or representations of our data. That string escaping is not a, uh, not a security feature, but just a way of properly representing your data for how you're going to use it. And we saw that you can make errors with misrepresentation and interpretation, 
how the string type in PHP, which is actually a byte array, makes it even more difficult, and how value objects can help you to get things right. But the most important thing I want you to take away from this talk is that the meaning of data is always defined by how we interpret it. Data itself is meaningless, it's not evil, it's not good, it's what we do with it that defines how it works. Right? Thank you. So, um, I would really appreciate if you left some feedback for this talk on Joined In. <coughs> I will also post my slides there uh, in a few moments. Um, if you have any questions, you can always walk up to me, ping me on Twitter, and I think we have time for some questions now. So, any questions? One in front here. Someone's bringing a microphone. Thank you. I have seen some people who used value objects like email, uh, phone number, uh, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, do you uh, see some value in s uh, such value objects? Yes, I definitely see value in those value objects. Um, maybe not only for this. Uh, in, in essence, you, um, you raise the level of abstraction, so it's easier to work with such an object. Uh, it has the additional, well, mental overhead of, well, adding an extra interpretation step to reach the higher level of abstraction. But also, uh, the usual value of such objects is that you can put business logic inside of them, which is something I didn't do in uh, the objects I showed. But uh, you could add the validation for email addresses and stuff like that within the email address constructor, and thus guarantee that there's never an invalid email address. So yeah, do use them. You are using them in practice? Yeah. OK, thanks. Any other questions? OK, one here in front. Uh, was there actually a project where you used those value objects? No, in I didn't. No. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, that might have been, uh, but I created these just for this talk. Any other questions? All right. Well, uh, feel free to walk up to me, find me somewhere here. I'll be around for another 30 minutes or something, then I have to leave for the airport. But thanks for attending, and I'll see you later. Thank you.